Hello and welcome to this edition of Fault Lines. I have with me Ambassador Bhadra Kumar and we'll be discussing something which both here in India as well as most other places in the world seems to take a distant second place and that's really the continent of Africa. Now Africa is of course a growing continent both in terms of population, its natural resources and the political weight it carries or should carry. But somehow it is always something which doesn't figure in the news unless it is bad news. Hurricane, some earthquake, some natural calamity, some other unfortunate happenings, then only we get Africa in the news. You know, coming back to the topic of Africa, that's mm -hmm. really a topic today. So we'll focus, though of course, the not that the north of Africa is in much better conditions either in terms of wars and other disturbances that disturbances that are taking place, Libya being one of the key ones where Gaddafi was uh, assassinated, ousted, and of course what happens in Ethiopia, uh, what's happening in Ethiopia, Somalia, etc. Leaving that part out, let's concentrate today on Sub-Saharan Africa where a lot of the instability that we now see is getting uh, much more visible. You have Afri Fra Francophone Africa in turmoil, you have also uh, Congo, you have Rwanda forces playing a role in Congo insurgency. So all these issues are there. So in the midst of this we have of course Kamala Harris's visit to Africa and we also had second summit for democracy which is the American attempt to play this as liberal versus authoritarianism. Liberalism versus authoritarianism as the only two currents in the world. So how do you, you know, you have a much better view of all this and you've been a student of all of this, if not a teacher of all of this for a long time. How do you see Africa today? Uh, how do you see its role in international politics, particularly with the kind of hegemonic role that West has tried to play for a long time? How do you see rea Africa reacting or proacting on this? You see, I see it from, uh, <coughs> I see three dimensions there. <coughs> Number one, the most important thing is that is if uh, all good politics is about uh, economics and the creation of wealth, of nations, then let's start from that point. <clears throat> it's a <clears throat> very rich continent in terms of its uh, resources. Uh, it will be scrapped at the top, you know, this hidden below, there's a vast resources in the continent. Secondly, uh, in the recent years, we've seen the growth rate appreciably increasing. So there is a kind of a dynamism which is evident there. And therefore, uh, you know, uh, the growth rate can really pick up well and there can be a phenomenal transformation in a conceivable period of time in a generation or two there. In other words, it's no longer the basket case or the dark continent as it was thought to be earlier portrayed to be yeah, thought to be earlier by uh, in the perceptions of uh, the international community uh, that is number one number two uh, ensuing from this there is a there is an acute struggle between uh, amongst the big powers and also among the not so big powers the second tier nations Turkey Saudi Arabia Iran and so on even India to some extent. Now this has uh, different ramifications. That is uh, one is that the Africans are getting uh, f most important from the Western point of view, they are getting more space to negotiate with the West because there is, there is, a, there is a counterpoint available for them to go to and we have seen it in a number of countries. China is playing it, as a yes, counterpart. And they find it very comfortable also doing that because the point is here is a couple of countries at least and Iran also, countries at least which are not dictating terms, prescribing anything. 
they can, uh, in other words, their internal processes are completely sequestered from the business that is being transacted, which is a very comfortable thing for the African elites because all the time the, uh, what they have experienced is a kind of a bullying mixed with blackmail that unless they did things in a certain way, there, will be a, there might be a price to pay. And the history shows that the West made it a point to, uh, uh, you know, to, to ram it down in the consciousness of the African elite. The uh, second part is this, that therefore, first I, when I stopped, you know, the, um, they are able to negotiate better. So uh, putting it differently, that sort of old uh, new colonial exploitation uh, is not, or rather it is bringing diminishing returns. And ultimately, if uh, this trend continues, China may be a big beneficiary, Russia may be a big beneficiary, because uh, the uh, kind of uh, image that these two powers have, West cannot match because of the history of the national liberation movements there and, and the, the colonial is, and alliances the is, and the complete exploitation they had no such history of exploiting exploitation they were not colonial powers and the africans have never seen them that way so there is a certain uh, you may call it uh, what joseph and i would call the soft power is also working in favor of working against the west there then, you know, there is a, lately now, there is an added um, dimension to it. Because um, I assess that the outcome of the uh, Ukraine war and all that has happening now in the recent years, and a new world order of multipolarity that is uh, taking shape, which is very evidently taking shape, it's only the timeline that is under discussion now. It is inevitable, that process. There, the, unlike in the Cold War era, the non-aligned movement didn't carry that much weight. It had a kind of an influence and an image and all that. But the Americans never really took it seriously. Russians did. But um, today, this majority of countries which have refused to toe the Western line, in Ukraine and have, uh, of course, they are bullied into voting in a certain way when a resolution comes in the United Nations General Assembly. That's a different matter because, you know, they're all extremely vulnerable still. That threshold has not been reached for they, them to... What you're saying is that in the sanctions, not a single African country has joined the sanctions. Yes. And therefore, you know, not only, not only on the sanctions, the whole uh, perception in the global south is uh, that what is happening today is of momentous consequence also for them. That uh, big or small, all countries will have a say in the global governance. And uh, no country can prescribe your way of life. You can pursue your own developmental strategies. You see, these are things which have uh, surged to the top today in the rhetoric that you hear from Russia and China. Now, this has a very big resonance in the African continent, surely. So, how does it translate geopolitically? Numbers count. And now these countries, if they take this line, already, despite all the bravado, the Western narrative is lost as a result of it. You know, it has turned out to be West versus the non-West. You know, West versus the rest. West versus the rest. So you see, something has to be done. Like in the north, you people will say, kuch karna hai. <laughs> you know, that is, a, 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 that is this uh, effort of this uh, democracy summit, as I see it. Uh, will it work? I doubt if it will work. The first because, one didn't. Hmm? Yeah. The first one didn't. It will not work. Yeah, it will not work because the, uh, there is a wrong notion that the Africans can be taken for granted, and they are uh, they can be shepherded into corridors, you know, uh, by an assertive mentor. That's not really so. It's actually the elite is politically very savvy. They understand it. They are weak, and therefore often they are not in a position to assert. 
but it doesn't mean that they don't understand it. And if an option develops for them, and if a space is created for them to operate their strategic autonomy, you may see a phenomenal difference in the situation in a very conceivable future, you know, in a matter of next five years, you know. So, you know, that actually makes an enormous amount of sense for two specific reasons which I'm going to add to what you're saying. One is the French had played a major role in Africa, particularly what is known as Francophone Africa, but it extended to the ex-Belgian colonies also because France, French was the major language there. Now, interestingly, it's clear that Francophone Africa is moving away from France. And Macron, when he came to Congo and gave uh, speeches, tried to dress down the journalists and the leaders of Congo, he got a very harsh reaction, both from the journalists as well as from the Congo leadership. So that, that old French tutelage that we will lead you is not working. And also on the matter of both army and finance, there seems to have, there seems to be a clear divergence now from France. There the growth of Russia, even to the extent of now uh, Prigozhin and his uh, troops coming yeah. in, in yeah. some of the places. That is an entirely different phenomenon. Eh? Wagner is an entirely different phenomenon. No, I'm saying the big going away from mm. France because mm. French le military leadership is slowly being taken over by the United States mm. now. They're directly now in various places, mm -hmm. which earlier they were actually working with the French, mm -hmm. the Americans. Mm -hmm. So French weakening mm -hmm. seems to have also led to America you asserting itself yeah. openly, but also delegitimizing the West yeah. that you are talking about. You see, the, there, is a, there is a de facto division of labor between Russia and China in, uh, in Africa, if you look at it closely. Uh, what can the Chinese do there? Chinese are able to put a lot of money on the table in a way that uh, Western countries are not going to be, it's not going to be possible for them to match that. You know, it has never happened before. So the earlier uh, thing was aid as imperialism, you know, this, uh, you, you give dole outs and then, you know, you cultivate elites and, you know, you orchestrate the political structure, power structure and you then get into the real business of exploiting the country for its resources and transfer the wealth to European continent. This is, this is the pattern there. But now, you know, uh, China is putting money on the table. You have uh, high-speed trains coming, various other types of infrastructural developments rapidly developing there. And this is visible to see. Yes, in, in, uh, in you know year to year, you can see the changes roads. taking place. So, uh, West is finding it very hard. That is one thing. And the second thing is, China is very aggressive trader, and it is a number one trader now in that region. And um, it is able to purchase from create purchasing power in the African countries by purchasing a lot of stuff from these countries, which generates money purchasing power they can do so they are they are really seeing their their liquidity problem their resources you know they are not uh, on a shoestring budget like that if it continues like this that china is buying a lot from these places that is the second one and then the, the third one is the kind of uh, development that inevitably takes place, whether it is in mining, whether it is in, you know, agricultural field, to maybe to export to China, you know, buyback arrangements, so on. But a number of, a lot of activities are taking place. The Europeans, you know, after the uh, liberation struggle and the decolonization, they never really rolled up, they just packed and left. They never really rolled up their sleeves and got into it the way the Chinese are doing now. That is there. But China is not getting involved in the politics. It's not uh, wetting its toes in security issues front. It closely monitors everything and it is extremely, it's very well abreast of events that is taking place. You can see their reactions, you know, that they understand the African situation very well. But then China has a long history. Even you remember Chauhan Lai's famous remark, you know, so it's a, 
they have a long history of uh, paying enormous attention to Africa. Hmm? But that part is Russia's can complement. If China alone were there in the situation, what I'm trying to say, this division of labor, when I mentioned it, it is working de facto, uh, China could have been ousted because they could have outmaneuvered China by uh, bringing about coups and political assassinations and getting the Chinese being thrown out of that places. But that's not happening because politically, Russians are moving in in a way in, uh, with their so immense soft power, engaging the African elites and this uh, Putin's initiative to have the Africa summit, the first one of the roaring success. It was a brilliant initiative because it brought together, in fact, elites, a number of them who were products even of their Patrice Lumumba University. You know, these are the, the, the old boys, you know, who were there and they are coming in. National liberation, liberation struggles, yes. inheritance. And uh, they, they, were, uh, they didn't have to be encouraged uh, to talk on those lines that the Russians are talking. They were enthused, you know, in fact, they were accelerated that, you know, this is the kind of environment that today is existing in Moscow. And just one little additional fact of Cuba. Cuba participated in liberation struggles, as you know, mm. against South Africa, for mm. instance. And of course, the battles were, Kalashnikovs really came to their own in Africa, mm. fighting liberation struggles, mm -hmm. apart from Vietnam and so on. So all See, that history is yeah. very much fresh in Africa yeah. to go and talk to the African yeah. people. See, the Russians um, uh, are not in the business of sending their armies out or establishing bases like this. Absolutely. They have to husband their resources. And uh, the, unlike in the earlier time, in the Soviet era, the uh, Russians are very careful about uh, getting overstretched abroad. So now we come to this Wagner phenomenon. They have studied the situation and they know that a very judicious, through a judicious exercise of power, the security situations can be handled and what the Western uh, military contingents have been doing is actually to use the presence as an instrument, a tool to manipulate. But on the other hand, the security situation can be contained in a certain way. And the African elites see, that the, if, uh, see the effectiveness of the Wagner group. But then the Russians are also not like the Soviets quite. That uh, in the downstream, Wagner also gets down to business. Like, for example, it gives security protection to economic projects in volatile areas, extremely volatile areas. So mining activities and such activities, diamond mines and so on, highly lucrative economic activities are possible to be sustained. The West has really speaking no answer to this. You see, therefore, you know, uh, this, uh, uh, I'm not very sanguine that the Africans will bite into this business of uh, democracy. If it were democracy, then South Africa should have been their closest friend. Now, South Africa is really taking legal aid to see that whether, notwithstanding the fact that uh, they would like, uh, that, that they are members of the IC, ICC, they are not in a mode to arrest Putin if he lands up there for the BRICS summit. They are trying ways and means to find how it is possible now. So you see, if it is democracy the problem, then you know why not deal with South Africa? And when Lavrov went there, it was a huge success, Lavrov's visit. And the South African foreign minister echoed all the things that the Russians love to hear from them. You know, So it, this is not about democracy. Zambia, they, are, they got a toehold there because in the last election, a, a, a new leadership came which was more pro-Western. So they are only using that as the ground. But for this objective realities being such as I explained, uh, I don't think this, Afri this American enterprise, this Biden's enterprise, democracy enterprise will travel far enough. It won't fly. It didn't in the first one as well. <clears throat> even then, it was considered to be a flop show. This doesn't seem to have even attracted much attention even in the Western media itself. I, I think we have covered a lot of ground. Of course, it opens up more grounds. Maybe we'll have to discuss what happens to non-alignment that existed then, because Nkrumah was one of the proponents, major proponents of that. And the African continent, continent itself 
still resonates with a lot of that pan-African part of the agenda that he had and others had. So we'll come back to this with you again when we meet in our continuing episodes of False Lines. We're going to wind this up here. Thank you very much for being yeah, with us. My pleasure. Cov covering a really large ground and also placing it in the context within which these developments that we see are happening. These developments are at the moment a set of episodes, as it were. But to look at the larger picture, I think that's the important part. This is all the time we have in NewsClick for False Lines today. Do keep watching NewsClick and also look at our False Lines show.